But now we have 20 minutes left, and I, I'd like to invite uh, uh, questions and comments from the audience. And uh, if you would like to point them to one single panelist, then, then uh, uh, do that. So uh, we have three questions already, so let's start from there. Inge Paul Hatton School of Governance in uh, Berlin. I have uh, three points. My first point is that at least in the first three presentations, I saw, I heard a lot of inappropriate language. I, I'm actually a little shocked when I hear that some of the false migrants are utility, Russian utility Nazi migrants. I mean, give me a break. At best, they are disutility reducers. Yeah, they have to follow, and they are certainly not rational because they may be in a state of panic, have no choice, have to run away, don't know really what to expect uh, 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 in future. So I think this economic model is in a pocket. At least I would turn to some more behavioral uh, economics or something like this in order to talk about this problem. My second point is also what bothers me is the individualization of the problem. To think about how individuals look at the problem and even the economics of individual decision making. When the real economics are one layer beyond, uh, below, because it is the German defense industry that drives these conflicts and compels people to run away, and we benefit defensively from it in Germany. While we, this is Merkel, when it comes to the refugees, we are exporting other personnel areas to, to Saudi Arabia and so on. So the real economics have to be uh, discussed. And also the, the benefits from the uh, migrants that we receive, uh, because uh, we failed to invest in education while we saw the demographic change coming. So now we, we, we are happy that we have such conflicts and that migrants come. My third point, the last point, comes back to the uh, 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 taxing the benefits. I have proposed in a German parliamentary committee uh, the following thing and was pulled out of the uh, room. Because since we uh, failed to see that we are a very fast aging population, I think we should um, say for every migrant, we accept from Africa, from Syria, well-trained, well-qualified, uh, and probably uh, we are getting our aid back from these countries. So I propose to have an escrow account for the uh, releasing uh, countries for Syria, for some African countries, uh, and put into this escrow account of the uh, um, uh, re releasing country the amount of uh, inve education investment that we saved and didn't have to spend because we take the migrant in. And then in future, we can use this money when peace returns maybe to Syria one day to uh, support the uh, rebuilding there. But please adjust the language. Yeah, good morning, everyone. I'm Thomas Summer, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Helsinki. Faculty of Social Sciences. I want to address my question to our Medicine Sans Frontier, uh, Medicine Without Borders uh, speaker. Um, I think that all the research being done on, conf on conflicts is not addressing the root causes of the conflicts. We have to find out, my question now, now is, who is responsible for all the conflicts in the world that is increasing in Libya? I'm originally from Cameroon. We have conflicts in Libya, in Syria, all over the world. I'm spreading. In the case of Syria, only God knows when the conflict there, there is going to end because arms, and in Libya as well, is in the hands of everybody. In, in Syria, is, I mean, it is the same thing. Where does the arms come from? What can we really do to alleviate the conflicts in order to reduce the number of refugees in the world? So please, let us, I mean, we are not addressing the root causes. So uh, please, what, what, since you've been working with all these refugees and people in conflict situations in the world, uh, you know, in different places, what 
is your response to this? Thank you. My name is Sandrine Dawepwani. I'm the regional research coordinator for Oxfam in West Africa. My first question uh, is for the first presenter. I wonder if you account for the international community attempt to support the population in both sides, meaning the host country and the country of departure, because I think that this could probably Im impact on the decision to, to move. Uh, my second point is an, an um, invitation to the researchers, because I, I, I was previously research fellow, and uh, I do know now that our theory is far from the field reality. So I invite you to get the field actors, the NGOs and so forth involved and to, in order to benefit from their insight. Thank you. Olga Shemekina, Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, I have a question for Jonathan Hall. Uh, you discussed uh, four approaches to acculturation. And uh, I don't think you mentioned if it's an like, individual choice uh, or is, um, does the government uh, have to do something with it? Can it influence people to I mean, take one path or another? Thank you. All right, so um, uh, perhaps uh, we have, will have a round of responses to those uh, comments, questions, and challenges. Uh, so perhaps we start uh, in the order of, of, of speakers. Um, I, will, I will deal with the international community first because I think I have a satisfying and incontroversial answer um, for that one. Um, we essentially, we want to account for everything that we can do um, that would influence both decisions to leave or decisions to stay, which will come through our analysis. I don't think what we have at present is entirely complete, and we haven't yet considered uh, precise actions by the international community, but that's something that we will do in future iterations. I appreciate the recommendation. Thank you. On language, the, the first thing I would say is that it's very difficult to talk about economics without using economics terms, and that's why I gave the sort of partial disclaimer at the start. Um, but I think we should be clear that although in the presentation we discuss what, what I would say is sort of, let's say, voluntary migration or economic migration in terms of utility maximization, I sought specifically not to use the terms in terms of migration that may be involuntary, precisely for the reasons you suggest. Um, I think potentially that got lost in the nature of the presentation where we extended, um, where we extended an economic model. But implicitly, the nature of the model itself should hold, uh, regardless of the language that is used. But I do agree that um, the use of language is something that's very important. I think one step removed from that I think we, I don't think it's inappropriate to consider that refugees are making rational decisions or that their decision has rationality at its core. That if you are in a panic about something, then the rational decision is quite possibly to leave. It doesn't mean that one is panicking and is irrational and makes an irrational decision. Similarly, in choice of destination country, we do see that whilst it's not the economic variables that are at play, we find that things like the likelihood of success of an asylum application from someone of a country of origin in a destination country is a factor in where people choose to go. And I think that, to me, paints a, it paints a very interesting picture because, you know, we're not dealing with, we're, we're not dealing with individuals with nothing. We're dealing with individuals who have had social networks, who maintain access to social networks and so forth. And these things, it seems logical to me, and this might be my bias as an economist, but it seems logical to me that those things will obviously feed into where individuals have a desire to go and so forth. Um, I think beyond that, on the level of individualization versus 
and the other things i i don't have enough experience to to comment on that i don't think it's my place i think if i made a comment it would be entirely conjecture and that would be inappropriate from my side yes thank you for your comments um the first ones were not maybe directed to me but i could just make a couple brief comments um, on your points. One is uh, with regards to the, the idea of adjusting your language and so on. I wondered if maybe it might be useful to distinguish between kind of the, uh, the overall values, you know, that we are trying to pursue on the one hand, and then the actual research that we conduct in the process of doing that. Um, I think to maybe, you know, like if you're throwing together all economics research that, you know, involves a rational choice model into something that has no value or pursues the wrong values or can choose things in, in a way which is always unhelpful, I think that's unhelpful, honestly. Uh, so I think, I mean, it's much better to think about, first of all, um, we should have good values, I think. And we all have to decide what those are, though. There's no scientific way to arrive at those. But once you, you know, have a set of values you're pursuing, I think, for example, rational choice is an extremely useful approach. It's useful for me in my research, for example, as a baseline to speak to, not to explain everything. So that's often a problem I have, for example, in, in I teach in psychology, but I'm, I'm often talking about rational choice models in those classes, not to say that they are correct models of human behavior, but to use them as a baseline against which we can compare other models of human behavior. And so to, thought, and, and to say, for example, that, ah, we shouldn't think about rational choice, I think is, is not helpful. But then to say that, um, you know, on the other hand, I agree with you completely that if we you know, frame human behavior as always uh, rational choice, then we skip over, as you mentioned slightly, the whole possibility of behavioral economics, uh, you know, heuristics and biases that we know exist. So, but I don't think any of these panelists here would, would think in that way. Um, so one should keep that in mind. The, se the second thing, um, the idea of individualizing as also being always a problem, again, I would disagree. I agree, though, when you think about if you, if you try to frame all of human behavior as being explained by rational choice and also have a you know, sort of bottom-up, micro-level, individual-level process you know, that, that aggregates, you know, I agree with you, but the thing is that's kind of a straw man in my opinion, in the, in the research. There are some people that think that way. But for example, how can individual, uh, an approach that takes the individual in focus be useful uh, when you pursue important values with your research? Okay, I'll give an example of, well, I have a certain set of values that I'm trying to pursue. Um, I don't know if I can get at my values, but I'll, I'll just point out one thing that in, in the research literature on diasporas, there's a very strong... Uh, sort of trend and theme within that literature that, that diaspora communities are a problem, that they are constantly causing problems, that they are fueling wars. Um, the new wars debate is an example of, of where this comes in very strongly. Uh, Mary Keldor uses the case of the Bosnian War to make her point that uh, far off communities live in, living in you know, places in Europe and, and North America you know, who don't experience the cost of this conflict are causing problems. Um, Colleen Huffler, another very um, influential uh, set of authors, probably the most cited article ever in Civil War, uh, for a couple of economists, uh, Paul Colleen and Huffler, you know, they, they argued the same point very strongly in that article. The thing is that their evidence is very poor, but they use an individual level argument. And so by going to the actual individual level, collecting the data and actually showing them that they're wrong, you can make a very powerful impact, you know, in terms of research, but also in terms of maybe having that spread out into policy as well, hopefully over time. So this is why I think that the individual level is still useful as an approach because you can't get away from it, you know, in the conversations that you're having. So that's, um, and, and it is, I mean, there are individual level processes at work and you should also perhaps couch them then in broader macro level processes, which you alluded to. Um, then uh, the, my last point was um, regards to government strategies. Yes, um, that literature on acculturation. Um, the work by uh, Sam Barry, I believe is his name, um, provides that particular model of acculturation, which is simple and useful from a, from a um, research point of view. It's not the only uh, 
the only way to think about acculturation, but it's a useful model. And his argument is that um, multiculturalism policies will be most conducive to biculturalism. Uh, so it's, you know, the, the point is that, yes, this is couched within a, uh, a policy framework. And within that policy framework, you have individual level strategies, which individuals adopt. But of course, that's shaped by the broader environment in which they're living. And so, of course, you know, the idea that complex identities and, and bicultural identity is conducive to reducing support for conflict uh, is kind of a boon for, or is, you know, uh, supportive of the idea that perhaps the swing away from multiculturalism policies that we're experiencing today with the growth of the extreme right and the, the shift in Europe and North America as an example of that is perhaps hugely problematic. Um, it could even be, for example, increasing support for uh, the ideology of conflict within certain segments of society. So, yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. And chills. Uh, I'd like to, to start by uh, the comment of uh, Sandrine. I'm sorry I didn't get your family name, but Sandrine saying, well, you were calling for cross-sector collaboration between uh, you know, scholars, researchers, and, and practitioners. And I would just like to echo this with one example, which recently struck my mind. In, um, in an executive training program, we had a political scientist coming and meeting with practitioners from basically aid workers from, from Syria, Somalia, Sudan, etc. And the topic was uh, hybrid political orders. So he spent about one hour explaining that in those countries, actually, the state is not the sole source of power, legitimacy, and authority, and it is widely shared with informal, traditional, and other forms of, uh, of authority. And uh, it was striking that after one hour, most of the participants said, well, it's 20 years that we know this and we navigate this every day and we work with it and we perfectly know all what you said. The only thing we learned is that it has a name. <laughs> so I, I was thinking that actually those social scientists could have gained 20 years because actually the, the, the concept came really, it's, it's 2011, 2012. So, so it really made it uh, to, to the, the, well, spreading in the academic community and then uh, making it from there to the OECD, DAC, et cetera, very recently, whereas practitioners uh, practice it every day. So to gain intuitions and really to, to have this cross-fertilization, I really support and very much would like to back your, your plea. Uh, on on uh, Richard, right, uh, your, your, your comment, uh, I will leave it to, to my colleague of MSF, but uh, the, the only thing is uh, that I would say is beware of monocausal explanation of crisis. Uh, because uh, at least uh, our students often they say, but is it this or that? And often it's uh, a bit of this and that, but it depends. So it's, uh, it's the main, uh, uh, let's say, response. Finally, uh, thank you, Inge Kaul, for, for your excellent uh, remark and, and very much. When you say, actually, we should review and adapt our language, I think what you mean probably is that we, we should review and adapt economics as a discipline, which, is, uh, which is, uh, uh, goes beyond language. And I think it's really extremely useful that you also mentioned uh, extensions uh, where economists being imperialistic, you know, have borrowed from uh, social psychology and, and many other disciplines. And, and, and the advances that we see now in behavioral economics are extremely relevant. And uh, the, the fact that indeed uh, uh, most of uh, individual decisions are taken automatically or, you know, try to conform social norms and the prevalence of pre-established mental models in explaining these individual decisions is finally making it a bit in the development world with some success and some uh, problems. I think it's great, even with the flaws in it, but the, that the 2015 World Development Report bring behavioral economies closer to the development community. What I noticed is that in the humanitarian sector, it's not, we are not yet there. When, it's, when we deal with humanitarian crisis, uh, the, you know, as much as the investors has been quick in picking up insights from behavioral economics and applying it to the behavior of investors on the capital markets, as much as I see that when we negotiate with the armed actors to try to reduce you know, the number and intensity of war crimes, we are still very much 
norms driven, saying, well, it's forbidden, it's bad. Actually, they know it's bad and they know it's forbidden, but they do cost benefit analysis. Plus, they think that it is, and it is becoming uh, what you mentioned about the attacks on hospitals and the medical mission is becoming normally and socially more accepted in many world theaters, Afghanistan, Syria, and, uh, and uh, Yemen. And this is really very, very uh, worrying. And I think we should collectively be much more aware and borrowing from behavioral economics in order to uh, try to engage armed actors, uh, both on a cost-benefit uh, level, but also to think how do we want to change or adapt in a medium-run mental models in order to make such attacks not acceptable anymore. Thank you. Sophia, the last word. Is yours. Okay. Well, uh, thank you and um, for the questions. And I try to get on to this uh, quite philosophical question of the underlying causes of uh, conflicts and who is responsible. I will probably just repeat what Gilles said, but in a more... Uh, medical or layman terms and not so economical. But I agree that I think conflicts are a little bit like individuals. There are as many reasons for conflicts as there are individuals in the world. And um, as long as something, someone, whatever, is benefiting from a conflict, it will probably continue. Exactly how to build a model to understand the cost benefits of conflicts and what is driving it. I am not in that kind of research area. Uh, it's for the colleagues here in the panel that try to do that in many different ways. Um, but I think that when a conflict has been going on for quite some time, and we have numerous examples of that, it becomes a little bit a self-playing piano also. You have a context like Sudan, like Afghanistan, with generations um, that have seen no stable society, have no... Um, references uh, of a, a context of a, a state and a system that you can believe in. And then it becomes even more difficult to resolve that situation. Um, but uh, that is on the uh, most philosophical level. On the practical level, or what I'm trying to, to uh, reinforce here, that is as long as we talk about all those models and the pros and cons and so on, um, when the benefits of stopping a conflict becomes greater than the costs, it will probably stop. But while waiting for that to happen, we can never forget the individuals that are suffering the consequences of that conflict. Okay, thank you, Sophie. That was a really good way of, uh, of uh, ending this panel. And I'm sure that the, the discussions and, and questions will emerge during the lunch as well and during the later, uh, later sessions uh, afternoon and tomorrow. So uh, let's go and have some more material nourishment besides this intellectual challenge that we had here uh, this morning. So thank you very much. Uh.